So, Bob, that's the long-winded warm-up. I hope that, uh, you know, it's always tough to be the after lunch, after lunch speaker. So this way, Bob, you're the second speaker. They're suitably warmed up for you. And uh, before you came here today, tell me, how many people have read a Bob Sanford book? Come on. Bob, look, look at my hands. <laughs> That's a good sign, Bob. Are you ready? Anyway, I'm pleased to know Bob. As you walk up here, I'll kind of give you more of your introduction because he's still busy writing. Uh, <laughs> Bob is, a, is, a, is an author and a water champion. He's written many books. Um, he started out as a naturalist and became a water guy. And it was all because of the grizzly bears, right? You going to tell that story? No, no, no. Get right into it. Okay. Bob, take it away.
here today to talk about the tremendous turbulence that exists right now at the nexus of water, food, biodiversity, and climate. A nexus that uh, turbulence we have to avoid getting involved in, in terms of the social, political, and economic crossfire of global climate politics that we're facing right now. And I think it's important at this history-defining moment to keep on track, to, to stay focused, to have a, a vision of the Okanagan and its future and ultimate best, and to stick with and build that vision. And I think that's what this conference is about. So to help you see the urgency of vision and action in support of that vision, I've been invited to talk about current risk and uncertainties that could affect everything that we talked about this morning. And I apologize to Zoe Kirk and others who heard me speaking in Penticton yesterday because I will repeat some of the things that I said then. But I will, however, try to summarize what I said yesterday uh, within the context of today's uh, forum. And I think Steve Conrad started talking about the U.S. election, but then he, he found the first foxhole into which he could jump as soon as he mentioned it. And uh, so I'm going to carry on into danger from where uh, Steve went a lot. As I said yesterday, uh, I happened to be in Minot, North Dakota, speaking at a watershed basin conference the day of the election and for several days following. And one of the interesting things that I observed was it's almost impossible to have a truly meaningful, in-depth, and critical discussion about either the election or its outcomes. It was really the strange, strangest thing. I found the same thing when I got back. Um, it was really hard to fathom. It was if millions of people had suddenly abandoned the moral principles and standards by which they had previously stood, revealing the darkness within our society we knew existed, but the need to live peaceably together demanded to be suppressed. And what I found very interesting, too, is that uh, 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 conventional wisdom and Twitter are telling us now that it, everything's going to be fine if we just give Donald, Chan Donald Trump a chance to form his cabinet and get going on the business of making America great again. Now, while anyone can be a global citizen by simply declaring yourself one, one of the things I have to say about working with the UN, and it's our goal to hold the state of the world above the interests of any given uh, nation state. Now, that doesn't mean that the UN or anyone involved in it can interfere with <coughs> politics. Uh, I'm reminded that even if one might think that Americans elected a bloviating jackass as president, it's really none of our business. In, in the larger context of what's happening on a global scale. But it's really interesting to know that uh, we do have an interest uh, where uh, the UN contravenes, or the US might contravene UN conventions to which the US is signatory. And I'd say there aren't many of those, uh, but they are important. On the climate matter, of course, the US is signatory to the Paris Accord, and its potential to failure, failure to meet its obligations with respect to that it ought to be of concern not just to those who consider themselves global citizens, but to everyone alive today. The President of the United States has repeatedly stated that climate change is a focus, and that once elected, he will tear up the Paris Accord. And what I'm here to say, again, and to remind everyone, is that climate change is not a focus. And one of the places that is going to be most immediately and dramatically impacted by climate disruption is Canada. And uh, so you might ask, well, what's going to happen? Well, now that, now that Donald Trump is the president, well, Trump has already announced that he would cancel the U.S. commitment to the Paris Accord. And as I mentioned last night, he has three avenues for doing so. Under the Paris Agreement, the countries volunteered to take steps to reduce their impacts on climate beginning in 2020. The U.S. Pledged, has pledged to reduce its greenhouse emissions to 26% below 2005 levels by 2025, and principally by moving away from burning coal to produce electricity. So Article 28 of the agreement gives the U.S. the option to formally withdraw from the uh, uh, agreement a year after it takes effect, simply by abandoning the 1992 United Nations framework Convention on Climate Change. And the second option available to Trump is to wait to the end of his first term of office and just dismiss it. And the third and easiest way for Trump to to do that would be to abandon all the rules, incentives, and programs designed to reduce emissions in the U.S., which would prevent the U.S. from living up to its commitments to the agreement. And uh, the simple way for him to do that, uh, of course, is to, uh, to eliminate the federal 
uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., which he threatens to do. So as we saw last week, when Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall rejected a carbon tax on the grounds that our American neighbors will no longer adhere to the Paris Accord, the risk here is that what's happening in the U.S. will slow global momentum on, on climate action, and in many places in the world, people will just hold up their hands in despair and say, well, the Americans aren't going to do it. It's hopeless for us. Why bother doing this at a local level? And what I wish to suggest here is this happens. Mr. Trump may be condemning future generations of Americans and the rest of the world to hell on earth. If this climate issue gets away on us, that's what it will be like. Now, that said, um, we can, it's not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination because what you do locally is far more important than what Mr. Trump might suggest this country may do, and it's the same inside the U.S. Canada could move around the uh, Brad Wall objection, and the Paris Agreement could eventually be proven to be completely Trump proof if all the nations and other countries in the world meet their promises in a timely manner. And if the private sector steps up to the plate, which we just saw at COP22 in Morocco, it's not impossible at all. Companies are figuring out that if climate uh, disruption continues, it could affect their businesses and, in fact, eliminate them. And I think that's being seen more widely. Uh, what I should also say is the world's going to get a lot hotter and a lot more crowded before anything gets done. And one of the concerns that we certainly have relates to that. The 2015 UN report on global population prospects uh, projected that we should expect to live in a world we'll share with between 9.7 billion people by 2050 and 11.2 billion people by 2100. And uh, what we see from that is quite interesting because while Europe shows a decline, most continents, including North America, show large growth, but uh, growth that can perhaps be somehow managed. Now that you look at this, you can see that Africa shows a quadrupling in numbers from 1.1 to 4.4 billion. And since Africa cannot feed itself now, how will it feed itself with four times more people? And the answer is, is that it won't. And I think Denise talked about food security this morning. I don't think you should underestimate the critical role of food security in the future and the critical role that agriculture is going to have to play in that. The rest of the world is going to have to feed Africa. And the problem, however, is that the deteriorating soil health, desertification and competition for land and water in tandem with climate warming is going to make it difficult to do so. And what we're also seeing is the world's closing in on itself. Countries are facing their own problems and lack compassion in some cases for what's happening elsewhere and may lead to ignoring large-scale famines uh, in the future. And public health officials uh, are, are also worried about uh, the effects of climate warming on um, the vulnerability of humans and the, the domestic plants and livestock upon which we depend. Uh, what we're seeing is that they're making it uh, vulnerable to these species vulnerable to, to, to these disease threats. And Denise brought that up again this, uh, this morning, too. The fact is, is that we have absolutely no idea what warmer mean temperatures will awaken. And what global health experts are telling us is that a vast storehouse of ancient bacterial DNA exists ready to leap into new bacterial forms with the slightest change in acidity, the right nutrients, and the right temperatures. So as we advance toward altered Earth system conditions, we'll be seeing life forms that we've never experienced before, many of which we'll likely fear. Ebola, H1N1, and Zika virus are a hint of what we will awaken in terms of pathogens in the future as we continue to change conditions of life on Earth. And we should expect similar circumstances with invasive species, and uh, we should be ready for anything. And that, too, was brought up very carefully this morning. So if you think of these matters, apply to someone else, well, they don't. They're here and you're dealing with them, and you're in the middle of them. And what we're also seeing is that the cumulative and compound effects of human numbers and activities on Earth system function are accelerating everywhere. And uh, in addition to altering our planet's global nutrient cycles, we're also, and this is really important, changing, causing changes in the chemistry, salinity, and temperature of our oceans. And what we're seeing, too, is that land use changes and our growing water demands 
have altered the global water cycle, which through altered precipitation patterns, of course, is affecting our climate. In addition, what we're seeing globally is that changes in Earth's system function are accelerating faster than even the most extreme projections. So a lot of the models that you have here now are using may not be able to keep up with the accelerated rate of these changes. And in terms of hydroclimatic change, 2050 is the new 2100, and 2030 is the new 2050. So you can see from this that climate change is coming to a theater near you, and it's, and it's coming fast. And here are some of the effects that we need to stabilize if we don't want adaptation and resilience in the Okanagan and elsewhere in Canada to be constantly be beyond reach. More than half of the entire surface of the planet and much of Canada has been significantly altered by human activities. And I have to honestly say, uh, I've been coming here probably for 20 years, and uh, I've observed that the Okanagan, in my view, and I don't come here often, which is often helpful, people say that about where I live too, but the Okanagan has changed almost beyond recognition in that period of time. And so when we talk about land use changes and what was said this morning, these are really important issues. The land use and, uh, and cover changes are only the beginning of the effects. And I thought it was interesting you had this, uh, uh, this uh, hydrologic cycle in your presentation, too. I like your fair. But um, what we're seeing is that they're only the beginning of the effects that human activities are having on the global hydrologic cycle. Uh, life, and you mentioned this this morning too, life is made possible by all the ways in which water reacts with nearly every element in the physical world. And some parameters have more influence than others over the nature and function of any given hydroclimatic circumstance. And changes in temperature are among the most important in that they cascade through all of the other biogeochemical processes. So if our global temperature changes, an entirely new hydrologic geometry is created around that change. And perhaps the most uh, frightening discovery of this young century is that that's exactly what's happening. The rate and manner in which water moves through the global hydrologic cycle is accelerating. And uh, it's been very difficult for even experts to grasp the full extent of what the loss of hydrologic stability means. And I, I find this new information just absolutely staggering. It's on the level of Bob's cosmic observation. Some 52 million cubic kilometers of water are being cyclically redistributed at any given moment through the global hydrologic cycle. And what we discovered is that 10 trillion metric tons of water are shifted from one hemisphere to the other in the form of winter snow cover during only one annual seasonal cycle. And the volume and weight of water moving continuously around the surface of the Earth and between the surface and the atmosphere annually is so great that its redistribution actually causes changes in the shape and the spin rate of the planet. And this in turn affects the behavior of all of the planet's fluid systems, including the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. And what we're also discovering is the ratio of snow to liquid water in the great seasonal redistribution of precipitation in the northern hemisphere is also changing with huge potential consequences for all of us. This was brought up this morning about uh, how important uh, your snow pack and snow cover and the duration of that are. And what we're also seeing is one of the places that's being most affected in North America, I mean in the Northern Hemisphere, is the Rocky Mountains. And as I said when I was here last, research conducted by the Western Canadian Cryospheric Network demonstrates that we lost some 300 glaciers in the Mountain National Parks region of the Rockies alone between 1920 and 2005. And the more recent research that uh, was done by the University of British Columbia uh, suggests that this loss is expected to continue with over 90% of the ice that exists in the interior ranges of Canada's western mountains to be gone by the end of this century. And what this does is it, it really confirms that the hydrology of the entire West is changing and changing quickly. But it should be noted that the loss of glacial ice is the symptom of the much larger problem that we were describing this morning. This morning, the same warming that is causing our glaciers to disappear is quickly reducing snowpack and the duration and extent of snow cover throughout the West. 
And what we've discovered is that snowpack and snow cover are now declining at 17% per decade. And uh, that, that was mentioned, I suppose, but what, what uh, we need to see here is that there's some uncertainty residing in the fact that what we can project temperature increases fairly accurately. Our knowledge is limited with respect to how warming will ultimately impact precipitation patterns of the log and we need to know more about that. <coughs> but the risk is real. The certainty is real, but the risk is real too. Water security for the entire West may be altered um, by changes in the timing and nature of precipitation. And by mid-century, the Canadian West could be as changed by this as it was by European settlement. Now, uh, I need to remind everyone of something that I always say, is that we've known for a century that for every degree Celsius of warming, we can expect the atmosphere to carry 7% more water vapor. And again, I remind you of this because it's a, a factor behind all of the things. It's a fundamental law of physics. Uh, that is behind a lot of these changes. So if you raise the temperature two degrees Celsius, you can carry 14% more water vapor, and, and the atmosphere, uh, if you warm it four degrees, will carry 28% more water vapor, which changes everything. And none of us have any idea of how much those changes would, 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 would cause uh, to, to alter. And the clausius quackenham relation is proving to be a critical driver of climate disruption. Storms are now occurring that feature higher relative humidity than ever experienced before. And this, in combination with rising sea surface temperatures, allows for greater evaporation and extreme cloudbursts and storms with greater power that last longer and carry more punch. And I uh, also want to remind you that uh, we are witnessing things that we haven't either seen before or recognized as such. And these include atmospheric areas. And I've talked about these before. But since I spoke here, it's kind of interesting to see. You start seeing them now on, you know, on weather casts, you know. And, uh, they were first bringing this up, and people looked at me like you get from Mars. But the bottom one here is uh, uh, the Pineapple Express that hits the west coast of North America. But the bigger one, I think, is just a stunning thing. These are beautiful to behold. That's the atmospheric river that, <coughs> that hit the west coast of Vancouver Island in October. And the point that I want to make here is that um, we've discovered that, uh, like the winds of the jet stream, atmospheric rivers derive their energy from differences in temperature between the poles and the tropics. And it's this difference in temperature uh, variation that is driving so many of these changes. And Mr. Trump's rhetoric notwithstanding, there is absolutely nothing uncertain about the link between temperature and increased atmospheric transport of water. To claim that this is a hoax is to ignore the fundamental laws of atmospheric physics. It's like saying that apples don't fall from trees. And uh, the risk here is that, and this is important to understand, that unless we stabilize the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, sustainability and adaptive resilience will forever remain a moving target. And that's worth understanding and knowing. And what we also seem to be seeing in Canada is that the loss of Arctic sea ice and the rapid reduction of the extent and duration of snow cover in the northern hemisphere are impacting the behavior of the northern hemisphere jet stream. And the less ice there is in the Arctic, the slower and wavier the jet stream becomes and the more erratically it behaves. And there's a growing realization from this research that the extent to which Arctic ice forms acts as a thermostat controlling climate right down to the mid-latitudes throughout the northern hemisphere. And on November 3rd of this year, and I want to point this out, Arctic sea ice coverage is more than 600,000 square kilometers below the previous record low, and nearly 2.5 million square kilometers below the October average. And the main reason for this is that October was warmer than usual for the entire month, but so was November. And on November 17th, temperatures over the North Pole and over much of the Arctic Ocean were 20 degrees Celsius above normal. No one has seen that before. So we can expect more erratic weather in southern Canada, and you can expect more erratic weather here. 
Water temperatures are also rising. Instead of being zero degrees C, sea temperatures are of 17 degrees Celsius have been recorded in the Arctic Ocean. And for the first time in tens of thousands of years, water that is above freezing point is impinging on the seabed of the Arctic Ocean where it encounters frozen sediments that are a seaward extension of permafrost on the land. And within these frozen sediments are embedded methane, uh, methane in a number of forms uh, of high rates and plath rates, which are now disintegrating as the sediments that contain them thaw, producing methane gas that has begun to rise to the surface in great bubble plumes. And uh, what happens is that in deep water, these plumes uh, will, uh, oh my God, just hang on a second. There we go. All right, um, what we're seeing is that, that, that in deep water, uh, these plumes will disappear, as you see in the, in the left hand uh, illustration. But in less than 50 to 100 meters of depth, the methane doesn't have time to dissolve. It emerges instead almost intact into the atmosphere, where in the immediate term, it appears to have a greenhouse effect that could be 100 times that of carbon dioxide. So alarmingly, we have found that the overall combination of ice loss and the loss of snow in the northern hemisphere may contribute an additional 50% to the direct warming effect caused by the addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the importance of this hasn't been realized. Now, where we have been saying that uh, adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by way of our emissions is warming the planet, instead now we have to say that the carbon dioxide which we've added to the atmosphere has already warmed the planet to the point where the feedback process is related to loss of reflectivity of ice and snow are themselves increasing the effect of those emissions. And this means, and think about this, this means that we just may have discovered that carbon dioxide may not be the only driver of climate change. Peter Wattams, uh, who is one of the world's leading experts on the relationship between sea ice and climate, characterized these kinds of feedbacks in a very interesting way. And some of you are my age and will understand who this person was. But when Jimi Hendrix played the guitar, he had this ability to play passages using feedbacks alone. His fingers didn't pluck the strings, but he manipulated electronic feedback to produce the sounds. And here's what Wadham says. We're fast approaching the stage where climate change will be playing the tune for us when we stand back and watch hopelessly with our reductions in carbon dioxide and we will fit. So we need to watch the Arctic. So if this weren't enough evidence to suggest to you that in the Canadian context, um, climate change is no hoax, let me suggest this. Recent research has demonstrated that the Alberta floods of 2013, the Cinnabon flood of 2014, the extreme drought that we all experienced in the West in 2015, and the Fort McMurray wildfires in 2016, all appear to be linked to human-caused climate effects over the Western Arctic. And uh, so what we see from this is the Arctic is well on its way to becoming a driver of, uh, rather than just a responder to uh, uh, change. So, and again, uh, as, uh, you're not going to get off the hook here. And the Okanagan has already indicated this morning. And at present, the Okanagan appears to be warming at twice the global rate. And Mel Reasoner uh, gave me a glimpse of what you can expect here, and I really like the way that Mel does these projections. Here, here's a bell curve of what a principal in a high school might expect from the results of any given exam. So notice the distribution. That's the kind of distribution you get in exam. And the same bell curve can be applied to changes you can expect here uh, in terms of, of warming climate. Uh, increases in the mean annual temperature move the bell curve uh, in the direction of hotter extremes. And uh, what you end up is less cold, more hot weather, and more record hot weather. And uh, what I've discovered talking to some of the people in this basin, many of your bridges and other increments, infra, infra, infrastructure elements are designed for a max of 40 degrees Celsius um, before they begin to wear out their elements of construction to fail. And what I've discovered is that under conservative projections by mid-century, you should expect uh, extreme temperatures somewhere in the area of 48 degrees Celsius. 
and on most days it will be like living today in Karachi and Pakistan. Now, at present, it's hard to know exactly what to expect, but we know it's going to be warmer. And for 40 years, climate scientists have been telling us there are going to be surprises as the trajectory of climate effects unfolds. And these surprises, surprises keep presenting themselves. On Monday, August 15, NASA released its global temperature data for July. It was announced that a stunning record had been broken. July 2016 was the hottest month since humanity began keeping records. And July of 2016 may in fact have been uh, marked the warmest absolute temperature since human civilization began. Now depending upon how you measure these temperatures and count them, there are different ways of doing this. July of 2016 already passed the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark, and perhaps even the two degrees Celsius mark of, uh, above the pre-industrial levels of the Paris Supreme hope to somehow limit warming on this planet. And warming may in fact have actually touched that two degrees limit during the February-March heat wave, which coincided with the peak of this year's El Nino. And uh, what this suggests is that we may not be able to keep those temperatures the Paris Agreement uh, from being achieved. And uncertainty is compounded <coughs> in the timing of these extreme weather events. The UN report on how the world might keep global temperatures from rising below 1.5 degrees isn't scheduled to be released until 2018. So where do we go from here? Well, I always say that the first thing that people often think when they're confronted with this question is just too overwhelming. I'm, I'm just one person, but right? what, what can one person do? Well, again, I was reminded of this yesterday regional district meeting again last night, the first thing that one person can do is stop being one person. And if you look around here, you're certainly not alone. Uh, in your knowledge, and as I understood this morning from both the presentations and the questions, you're certainly not alone in your, not, in your concerns or your principles. And water and living systems, in my mind, that generate and purify water have to be seen as vital water infrastructure. And you can build resilience with it. So maybe Michael Blackstock's idea of water, treating water as if it were alive, may not be such a bad idea. I believe that if we are to be successful in retreating from the brink of climate problems, we need a better handle on the critical thresholds that exist within our climate system and better connect them to associated social, economic, public health, and political risks and tipping points. And to do that, Canada urgently needs a new water method. And if we are to prosper in rapidly changing global hydrologic conditions, we need it now. And that ethic could begin here. In closing, I want to say that climate change is clearly not a, a hoax. And I'm sure that none of us here today need to be reminded that there's something far greater at stake than simply adapting somehow to change and sustaining what we have now. What's at stake in the future? And I think the ultimate goal to which we should be aiming locally is to preserve our prosperity and our profound <coughs> sense of place while making the Okanagan a place where people want to live, not leave in the warming world. And as I said at the outset, you have room to move here, and I go to places that don't. You have room to move, so move now while that room still exists. And in this, I wish you every success. Thank you very much.